Heavenly Father, we come before you again, Lord, thanking you for uh, just who you are. And we do want to give you praise, um, even when we don't want to give you praise. We want to give you praise. And so, Lord, as we get into our word, your word, as always, we do ask for um, conviction, edification, challenge, change, comfort, and just to be uh, transformed by the spirit and the word. And we glorify you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so we are in Galatians. We are coming to the close of Galatians. So this week we are in Galatians 6, 2 through 6, 6. All right, so... um. You guys remember <clears throat> last week we spoke of being uh, crucified, our flesh being crucified to the cross, and supposedly we're supposed to render the old nature, the old man dead. And death does not mean ceasing to exist. It just means separation, so separated from God. But the old nature, that dead man, is like a zombie, and... If you don't keep your foot on his neck, he jumps up and there you go again, off into something that you said you weren't going to do again anymore. But it says, let us not be conceited and provoking one another, bringing out the evil in other people by just being, being antagonistic or smart mouth or having comments to say and things of that nature. To be kind and gentle and graceful in your words and in your speech. And then verse 1 of chapter 6 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritually mature, come alongside them and restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Because you to yourself can fall into their sin or any other type of sin. Maybe their sin doesn't bother you. And so you think you're all this and that. But then you have your own thing. And wow, it happens. So we are picking up in verse 2. And this is titled, Serving to Bless. So remember... If any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritually mature, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Verse 2. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, so here in verse 2, the word for bear is bastazo. Um, it means to come alongside and support a brother or sister who was overburdened with something. Now, that burden could be a result of having been overtaken by a trespass or just some other life circumstance. But the word here for burden is borrows. Now, it means to be overweighted and loaded down beyond one's strength to carry. In Acts uh, 15, 28, and 29, when they were settling the question of making the disciples or, or the Gentiles get circumcised and to keep the law, keep the law, the apostles gave this order. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from sexual immorality. In other words... God did not say, lay on you Gentiles the Jewish traditions and laws. That would be overburdening you. And so he says not to do that. Um, bearing burdens of this type, that's in verse 2, is to share in another's troubles until the storm is over or until they have enough strength regained to go on alone. Think about uh, soldiers in battle. Uh, they carry their wounded brothers and sisters nowadays uh, to safety where they can be restored and made new again. So it's 
coming alongside and shouldering a burden with someone, mm -hmm. right? This is the type of burden uh, bearing that we see as Jesus was being led to the location of his crucifixion. After being beaten and whipped, Jesus collapsed and was just too weak to carry his own cross any further. In Luke twenty two thirty six, 36, it says, Now as they led Jesus away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. So as Jesus was carrying his cross to the place of being crucified, physically he was just too weak to carry it and collapsed. And so they got another brother to come along and carry his cross to the place where he would be crucified. That is sharing in another's burden. Now, unfortunately, on one hand, um, sometimes pride may keep someone from asking for the help that they need when they're in need. It's like, no, oh, I'm not going to ask for help. Well, that's a form of pride, right? You need help, you ask for help. You come to the church and you get help. Um, because this is an act of love providing a hand up by assisting someone with their responsibility. It's not a hand out freeing somebody from responsibility who does not take accountability for their own stuff. Big difference, right? This is the law of Christ, which is the law of love. In other words, is doing for others as you would have them do for you, right? Um, as my kids got older, sometimes they would want me to babysit the grandkids. Okay, it's cool. I don't have a problem babysitting the grandkids. But you want me to babysit the grandkids so that you can go clubbing. Well, guess what? I am not available. Right? Every now and then, okay. But if you need some help with the kids so you can go to work, so you can provide for your kids and pay the bills and live in your own place, okay, I can help you with that. It's a big difference. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 or 7 states this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is... Not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love, love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful. And love endures through every circumstance. So it's in love that we patiently help bear another's burden. Does that make sense? And sometimes that just may be just sitting with someone. Um, the book of Job, it started out great. He had three, three friends that came alongside him and they just shared in his burden silently. Then they started talking, and they became uh, miserable comforters. Love is an action. It's not standing on the sidelines, watching the last straw break another brother's back. And I used to wonder about that all the time. What do they mean, the straw that breaks the camel's back? And so then I kind of got a picture of a camel with a whole bunch of stuff on him and his legs are shaking. And then somebody drops a little straw there and he just... <laughs> okay. That's not what love does. Although we all have burdens to bear, there are many burdens exceeding the strength of those of us who are underneath them. And it's in these cases, God has not meant for us to shoulder these type of burdens alone, right? Um, 
Some of us have had family members that have gotten older and they need care and they need help and all this type of stuff. Maybe you can't afford to get them some help or maybe the family has to pull together. But if you're not a person who's been gifted with that type of um, medical support type thing, caring from somebody is overwhelming. I mean, it's like, I love you, but I cannot do this, right? And this is when people need to come together. And, you know, I was in the hospital when I got shot, but there was a rotation of nurses that came in. It wasn't just one person doing it all the time, you know? And so it's like, these are burdens that we are meant to share with one another. Now... To legalistic folks who want to keep the law, um, as we're going through here in the book of Galatians, the Holy Spirit says, bearing one another's burdens is the second great commandment of the law, loving your neighbor as yourself. So for you legalists, if you want to fulfill the law, here's your law to fulfill. Lay your life down for your brethren and love in love and bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse three says, for if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Okay, so we're on one end. Pride may keep a brother or sister in need from asking for help in their need. On the other hand, pride will likewise tell another believer that helping another saint is beneath them. Because people think that they are elevated. I don't have that problem. Why do you? Right? I mean, that's just how we are as people. Psalm 62, 9 and 11, it makes this declaration. Surely, man of low degree are a vapor. Now, for those who think they are something, they'll say, yeah. You low degree people are a vapor. But then it says, men of high degree are a lie. And if they are weighed on the scales, all together, they're lighter than a vapor. God has spoken once and twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. So what God is saying there is, men of low degree are a vapor. And all you who exalt yourself, if I add you with the vapor group, both of you together are still lighter than a vapor. You're nothing. When we compare ourselves to other people, we can always find somebody that we believe ourselves to be greater than. However, other people are not the standard that we live by. The Lord is the standard. So in other words... If you think you're something, who do you think you are when you compare yourself to the Lord? That's the standard. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, it states this. For we are not, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves to others. Oh, don't worry. We didn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men are who tell you that they are important, but they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as a standard of measurement. Oh, how ignorant and foolish and unwise they are. The New Living Translation words, uh, verse Three, like this. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. <laughs> the point that the Lord is not making is that we deceive ourselves if we are nothing. That's deception. The point is we are nothing and yet somehow convince ourselves that we are something, that we are more than just dust. See, each of us is made from the same dust pile and none of our dust 
is greater than the next person's dust. All the way back in Genesis 2, 7, it states, The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being, a living soul. And then after Adam and Eve fell in Genesis 3, 19, the Lord told Adam, For out of the ground you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now, we know when you dust your house, you know what that dust is? That dust is all you falling off of you. It's just all skin particles. <laughs> so when you go somewhere dusty, you're breathing in people. Dusty people. <laughs> I remember like being in the hospital and since I was paralyzed, they had to do their little turnover thing, turnover thing. And one day they turned me over and there was all this little black stuff on the sheet. And I was like, what the heck is that? And they said, that's you. I was like, oh, <laughs> yuck. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, your mattress gets heavier over the years because <laughs> all your little dust mites are going down into the mattress. You ever wonder why your mattress weighs way more after you try to get rid of it than it did when you first got it? There you go. Dust. But check this out. Since we are nothing but dust bunnies. <laughs> Psalms 103.13 says, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, who love him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. God never loses sight of who we are. <laughs> Right? You're like, oh, look, my dust just fell in some mud. And we're like, oh, I'm so horrible. He's like, you're dust. But because we forget that we're dust, or that our dust is of a higher grade than that person's dust. <laughs> Jeremiah 17, 9, 9, 9 states, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the Lord says, I, the Lord, search the heart and the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. You may lie to yourself. And most of us do lie to ourselves. That's why we do stupid stuff and make mistakes. Because I convinced me that this is going to work. But unlike humans, God never loses sight of who we are. It's we who lies to our own selves, and then we don't even know it. But Jesus said this, if you want to be great, and remember, it says, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Well, Jesus said, if you really want to be great and you really want to do something then this is what it is. He who was first must be the servant of all. So if you want to be great, become a slave to everyone else. That's kind of upside down in the world, right? If I'm great, everybody serves me. But then God gives us babies to show us how the greatest has to become the servant. Because when you have a baby, you don't have the baby. The baby has you. The baby tells you when you're going to get up. The baby tells you when you will not go to sleep. The baby tells you when I want to eat. When I want to be changed. 
And then when I just want to holler and make you run around trying to figure out what's wrong with me, because I am the boss. <laughs> and I can't even talk. <laughs> That's why Philippians 4, 4 2 tell, gives us this command. Let us not be conceited, but in lowliness of mind, let each of us esteem others better than himself. Let us not look out for our own interests, but also for the interests of others. In other words, in all we do, let's display God's love and lay our life down for our brethren who are in need. Embrace this mindset. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about the only somebody, Jesus Christ. Verse four says, but let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. OK, to examine your own work means to look inward at your own actions, thoughts and motives and what's behind them and then line that up against the word of God. Okay, so the word for examine is dokimazo. Um, it means to scrutinize, to see whether a thing is genuine or not. And that is our spiritual acid test. It's to prove or to prove finding out if my work is good and perfect according to to the will of God, and it's acceptable and well-pleasing to the Lord, right? I remember, I don't, I don't, I don't remember where I was at, but there was this family moving in, and we were kind of like sitting there watching them move in and it was like this mom and she was trying to move stuff whatever and we were just kind of sitting there like whatever but then the daughter came out and then we all wanted to help okay so that was not a good examination of work that work was false we could care less about the lady struggling does that make sense so we have to test our motives and the reasons why we're doing what we're doing to see if it's for the Lord. Um, in the church or in the Christian world, we see a lot of ministries and a lot of doctrines that are really just straight out scams. But by the world standards, because those ministers and those ministries are tremendously prosperous, people think including those who are leading them, that their works are approved before God. But they're really not. Some people um, believe themselves to be rejoicing in their work before the Lord when they know someone has fallen or has been overtaken by a trespass. And then they can pat themselves on the back and say, I haven't done that because I'm so spiritual. That's not rejoicing in the Lord. Right. That's rejoicing in somebody's misery. In Galatia, the Judaizers wanted to be rejoicing in themselves because they had taught others that they needed to be circumcised. And when some of them actually did go through the process of circumcision, these Judaizers were rejoicing and saying they're rejoicing in the Lord. But that's glorifying self while being unloving to others. So we have to examine our work. Now, to rejoice in, own, in one's own self and not in another means to first recognize my insufficiency to do anything good and righteous that is apart from the Lord working in me. So, Not 
rejoicing in what someone else is doing, but rejoicing in what the Lord is doing through me. To rejoice in one's own self does not mean riding the coattails of someone else's walk. It doesn't mean patting myself on the back because I know them or follow them. A lot of times you talk to Christians and they'll be like, well, I follow the ministry of such and such. Okay. It means not rejoicing in somebody else's walk because of something that I taught them. Mm -hmm. And and that's that's how the, the Judaizers would look at those who they taught that they needed to keep the law and be circumcised. Because then they could say, look at will look at look at the results, right? And it's rejoicing in the flesh, but it's not rejoicing in the Lord. So rejoicing in the Lord is recognizing that anything good that came through me, he did it. And you don't know how hard that is every week, preparing messages. Okay, verse 5. It says, for each one shall bear his own load. Okay, now this isn't contradicting verse 2 where we, we were told to bear one another's burdens. In verse 2, remember, burdens meant something too heavy to carry alone. And the word for burdens in verse 2 is borrows. However, the word here in verse 5 for, for burden or load is forton. For, for, anyway, it's a word. It's a different word. Okay. It means our own individual burdens that belong to us alone. Um, I'll use being hungry, for example. If you're hungry, nobody else can eat for you. Nobody can carry that burden for you. That's your burden. Your hunger is yours. So verse 5 speaks of personal obligations that Christ has laid upon his individual followers. It means as each soldier is responsible for carrying his own pack, his own backpack and weapons, so too we have to bear our own burden of the cross that the Lord has given us in this life. Um in verse 2, Paul is speaking of our need to care for others in the body of Christ. But here in verse 5, is speaking of our accountability before God. This means every part of our own walk. Um, your burden could be your act of repentance. Or it could be your praise. It's your burden, right? When you go through something... People can come and comfort you, but it's still your burden. If you get sick, I mean, I can be there, but really deep, deep down, I'm thinking, I'm glad that's not me. I'm just being honest, right? You see somebody get in trouble, and you're like, oh, brother, whew, I'm glad it wasn't me. I'm not going to say that, and I'm going to try not to think it, but it's still there, <laughs> That's your burden. <laughs> you know. Last night we kind of like had an incident. We were helping a lady. She was arguing with her, whoever, I don't know. But I needed someone to translate. So I got my next door neighbor. And so he was kind of translating and the police came. And then the police asked us for our IDs. And, you know. I started getting my wallet out because they asked him first. He's like, no, I don't have one. So I'm kind of like, well, that was a strange answer. So I'm getting my ID out and everything. Then he goes, I hope I don't have a warrant. Oh. <laughs> it's like, oh, I understand that. And I'm glad I ain't got one. <laughs> so those are burdens. That are your own. So each must bear our own burden. Uh, this means every part of our own walk. 
but it's of but if that burden is of Christ, remember what Jesus said. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, sometimes I still argue with God about that. It's like, you say this is light. Okay, I don't know what I'm doing wrong here because this is not light. And of course, it's my fault. It's not his fault, but still. Pastor John Schaefer of Calvary Chapel, First Love, wrote a devotion from Proverbs 14.10. Um, Proverbs 14.10 says, Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one can share its joy. So he says, There is not a friend who can be fully understanding or perfectly having compassion on the misery you feel. Even if we fully tell them that we are go- what we are going through, we still have to go through it alone inside of ourselves. Maybe the friend is good at encouraging, but only when we know how truly sad, distressed, and depressed we and uh, we really feel. The friend can walk with you, but not, but not, and slightly bear your burden. But you still have to carry your own load. We still have to walk through it through the deeper things with a sense of aloneness. Even our joys are our own to enjoy, and no one else can really feel how happy we feel about about some good thing. But of course, the presence of the Lord and his reminders of how to get through it are always there to comfort a weary heart. And if you guys know John, you know, his, his wife, Maureen, she died a few years ago from cancer. And so... He was, he's always been an encouraging, gentle brother, you know. For me, a lot of guys, they're like so nice and gentle. They're like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> and I'm like way on the other side of the spectrum, you know, and I hear them talk to people and I'm like, I would have never thought about saying it like that. I'm like, shut up, get over it. Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> So I'm learning. To be nicer. I'm trying to be. I don't know. It's like kids fall down. Like, shut up, boy. Get up. Oh, but the baby's hurt. The baby ain't a baby. Shut up. Get up. Go outside and play. I don't know. I think I'm just from a different time. Because when I got sick, it didn't matter. If I wasn't bleeding out, I was still going to school. I was going to school with Kleenex. I was going to school with a bottle of pills. I was going to school. There was no out. (laughs) Spelling like mothballs, liniment, and Vicks and everything else, but you were going to school. Now they're like, oh, if your child is sniffing, stay home. Why? Kids are a a bundle of diseases that they stick together and give them to each other, and then they grow up and have strong immune systems. (laughs) Anyway, let me get back to the notes. Verse 6. Let him who was taught the word share in all... Good things with him who teaches. Okay. So the next couple verses, even though we won't get to verse 7 till next week, um, are dealing specifically with giving. Now, it's not one of the topics that I would like to speak on, but we teach verse by verse, and here's the verse. So the word here for share, when it says, let him who is taught share in all good things, The word is koinonia, and koinonia means fellowship. It's the sharing in intimate communion with another brother or sister and the Lord. This means to joyfully make oneself a sharer or a partner with the brethren. However, since this is specifically speaking of giving, 
It's not speaking about payment. It's speaking about sharing. It's willfully giving and and um, willfully giving and supporting the teachers and the ministries that you are in. And this is an entirely New Testament concept. Um, it's done out of love from a willful heart as opposed to the mandatory Old Testament law of tithing and temple tax. See, in the Old Testament, God said, here's the law you will give. And basically they gave like, I, th I think it was almost like 35%. There was the 10% on this and the 10% on that, whatever, but it was mandatory. So to support the priests and the ministry and the temple, it was mandatory, right? But in Christ, it wasn't mandatory. It was willfully. So it was a new concept. It's sharing, not paying. Um. Like I said... It's not something that I want to talk about much, but I'm just going to read some scriptures. First Corinthians 9, 11 through 14 says, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? Do you not know that those who minister in the holy things eat of the things of the temple and those who serve at the altar partake of the offering of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. As Christians, supporting the ministry where we are being spiritually fed and are serving in should come as a privilege and a blessing, not as a burden. Now, people take offense at supporting pastors who are feeding them spiritually. But 1 Timothy 5.17 says this, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and a laborer is worthy of his wages. Okay. For here, I have... I'm more concerned about the bills being paid. And I'll just kind of leave it at that. So, my thing is, wherever you are being fed, whatever ministry it is, it's God's inviting you to share in supporting that. But people always have issues with that now but they have zero issue with paying a therapist an hourly wage <laughs> now think about it in therapy when your hour is up your session ends and you are kindly shuffled out the door to make another appointment so you can pay for your next visit but pastors and leaders in ministry are on the clock 24 7. I mean, that means late night phone calls, paying house visits, getting stuck in the middle of domestic issues, and any other life situation that comes up. All on top of preparing messages every week. I have people tell me, oh, but you only, you only work on Sunday. <laughs> and all you do is talk. Okay. When when can I talk? <laughs> and then a lot of guys, you know, especially when we have men here, I like to try to get them involved and do uh, communion or edification. It's like five to eight minutes. So I'll sit down with them and explain to them, you know, hermeneutics and how to, you know, whatever study put it together. And it's like, you got five to eight minutes. And then they'll call me stressed out. Oh, what am I? What am I? You're only doing it for five to eight minutes once a month. Oh, oh. you do this every week. Oh, brother, I appreciate you. I'm just saying. 
It's not. I don't know why people think this is a great, glorious thing. Because it's, it's not. If you trust the church that you're at with your spiritual health, you should be willing to share financial support and trust that they will use it wisely according to the will of God. It doesn't make sense to sit up under something that you say you trust, but I'm not going to support it. It just doesn't make sense. And then it makes even less sense to say, I want to lead in the ministry here, but you don't want to support it. That doesn't make sense. Well, I came to the church to get what I can get out of it. That's upside down. God gifted you to bring it to the table. Not for you to go to the table and take off the table. It's not a smorgasbord. It's better to serve than be served. Romans 15, 25 says this, and Paul says, but now I'm going to Jerusalem to, Jer to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Acacia, Acacia, Acacia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. And in that case, Paul was saying, listen, you guys are saved because of the Jews who first became Christians in Jerusalem, right? But the Christians, the Jews who are in Jerusalem at this time, they were like really poor. They were starving. There was a famine. And Paul was going around the churches and taking up an offering to bring back to the, to the Jerusalem saints. So he's saying, listen, the root supports you. You don't support the root. It's your duty to bless them, right? And for us, God says, I'll bless those who bless Israel. Well, our entire Bible is Jewish. All the prophets were Jews. They all came from Israel. Jesus is a Jew. Everybody is a Jew. Where do we learn about God from? The Jews. Bless those who bless Israel. And I'll curse those who curse Israel. Martin Luther said, I often wondered why all the apostles reiterated their requests with such embarrassing frequency. We have come to understand why it is so necessary to repeat the warning or the admonition in this verse. When Satan cannot suppress the teaching of the gospel by force, he tries to accomplish this person, this purpose by striking the ministers of the gospel with poverty. I have a brother from Africa, and he said he did not want to be a pastor because he did not want to be poor. And he struggled with his call. And it's like, I get it, but I get it. And so to us, the scripture says, and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We are here serving in order to bless. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you um, for your continual blessing in the word when you show us who you are show us who we are and how we are to live for you ministering to one another we thank you lord that uh you never leave us you never forsake forsake us you stay with us as your created dust bunnies and help us lord to ever keep our hearts and eyes on you 
even in the midst of struggling, rebelling, and just outright unbelieving. We thank you that you keep us, that you're the potter and we are nothing but the clay. Um, and for anyone listening to my voice, if you know that you are dust, but in need of the potter's hand to save you, and you know that Jesus is the only way, you believe this, just say this prayer with me. Jesus, I believe that you are God, that you died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Thank you for making me your child and help me to walk in your ways. If you said that prayer and you believe it in your heart, you are now more than a creation of God. You are a child of God. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word today. We ask that you bless us, keep everyone safe throughout our week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.